Just a quick reminder before we get into the lesson to download the hands-on lab exercises that accompany this complete CCNA course. I'll include the link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and hit the notifications bell so you don't miss any of the lessons in the course. Okay, let's get into it. In this lecture, you'll learn about manipulating the spanning tree root bridge election. Because spanning tree selects paths pointing towards and away from the root bridge for forwarding traffic along, the root bridge acts as a center point of the LAN. Best practice is to ensure that a pair of high-end core switches are selected as the first and second most preferred root bridge. You can manipulate the root bridge election by setting bridge priority on your switches. The default value is 32768 and the lowest number is preferred. In the case of a tie, the switch with the lowest MAC address will be selected. So if you do not manually set the bridge priority on your switches, they're all going to default to 32768 and the switch with the lowest MAC address will be the root bridge and that is liable to be the oldest switch in your network. If you think about it, whenever Cisco make a new switch, they're going to increment the MAC address on there. So the lowest MAC address is probably going to be the oldest switch. So that is likely to give you suboptimal root bridge selection. In our example here, all switches have been left with the default bridge priority. And you'd be surprised at how often this does actually happen in production networks. Because spanning tree works just fine straight out of the box. On a lot of networks, the administrators don't touch it at all. They just leave it as is. And that can lead to the problem that you see here. So in our example, the switch with the lowest MAC address becomes the root bridge, and that happens to be the old switch that we've got in the warehouse down in the bottom right. That old warehouse switch has got low bandwidth links, so it's maybe got fast Ethernet links compared to gigabit Ethernet or better elsewhere, and it's old, so it's got limited CPU and memory resources. If we check this, I go on to a switch, it happens to be this the warehouse switch, and I do a show spanning tree VLAN 1, and I can see that this bridge is the root, and the priority is the default of 32768. If we now look at the actual paths that traffic will take throughout our network. So in the diagram now, I've removed links that have got blocking ports on them. So this shows the spanning tree that traffic is going to be forwarded over. And let's see what would happen if we had a PC that was connected into the Axis 1 switch on the left, and it sent traffic to the Axis 3 switch over near the right-hand side. So the PC connected to Axis 1 sends some traffic in with a destination address of the other PC, Axis 1 will send it to distribution 2, it will then go to core 1, then to distribution 3, then Axis 4, then the warehouse, and then Axis 3. So it's pinging around all over the network and going via the warehouse switch. And it's 7 hops in total. So that's really a suboptimal root bridge selection there. All traffic between different pairs of distribution switches will go over an indirect path and transit that old switch in the warehouse. That's likely to congest its links, overwhelm its CPU and RAM, and of course lead to suboptimal performance. So what we should have done was configure the root bridge to be sitting on one of our core switches so that all traffic is going to go through that path instead. The way that you set this is at global config on the switch that you want to be the root bridge, spanning tree VLAN 1 root primary. So you can have different switches being the root bridge for different VLANs. Here we're using VLAN 1 for our example. When you put that command in, it sets a bridge priority of 24576, which is better than the default bridge priority. So it is manipulating the election so that this switch will be elected as the root bridge. 
To verify it, I go on to core one, do my usual command, show spanning tree for VLAN one, and I can see the message, this bridge is the root, and I can see the priority is 24576. If we now look at the spanning tree, that's what you can see in the diagram here. Again, we've set the core bridge as the root bridge, and I've taken out all of the links that have got blocking parts on there. If we now send traffic from a PC connected into Axis 1, sending it to another PC that's connected to Axis 3, the path that will go along is Axis 1 to Distribution 2 to Core 1, to distribution four to access three. So you can now see it's only five hops as compared to the seven hops that we had before. It's going along the most direct path, which is going through the core. So that is much more optimal root bridge placement. For the same example, if the core one switch fails, we want to ensure that traffic still goes through the most direct centralized path. So to do that, we need to configure core two to be the next most preferred root bridge. If we didn't do that and core one went down, when we had that outage, we would be back to the warehouse being the root bridge again. So we want to avoid that. We always want traffic to be going through the core. So to do that, we go onto the command line on core two and we say spanning tree VLAN one root secondary. So it's root primary, on the switch you want to be the root bridge and it's root secondary on the switch that you want to be the backup. That sets a bridge priority of 28672. So we go back a couple of slides, you'll see that for the primary it's 24576 and for the secondary it's 28672. Here I've gone on to core two, I've verified it with a show spanning tree VLAN 1. Again, the same command that we always use. Here I can see that the root bridge is still on core 1 and that this has got the next best priority. So this will be the second most preferred switch. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to get the complete course ad free right now, then you can enroll in my CCNA Gold Bootcamp by clicking the link above my head or in the description. It also includes full study notes, quizzes, and 150 pages of additional troubleshooting labs you can't find anywhere else.